the answers that we got to were so much better than answers that any one of us could have ever arrived at. Hey folks, welcome back to the Unbeatable Mind Podcast. This is your host, Mark Devine. Thanks so much for joining me today. Super appreciate your time. And I promise you it'll be well worth it. My guest today is Susan Scott, who is a tremendous co- leadership coach and development expert focused on having fierce conversations, something that is near and dear to my heart, though I am far from an expert. In fact, I'm mostly a bumbling fool. So I'm looking forward to learning from Susan. Before I introduce her in a little bit more detail, let me mention that my book, Staring Down the Wolf, came out the week before we all went on lockdown. So you may or may not have heard about it. There's been a lot of other things in the news that have captured our collective attention. So let me take a moment to tell you about it again. So Staring Down the Wolf is all about developing emotional awareness and strength as a leader. Oftentimes when it comes to our teams, leaders are the limiting factor because they bring their baggage. They're afraid to have those fierce conversations that Susan and I are going to talk about, or they do it unskillfully. Or they're a perfectionist or an absolutist or judgmentalist or righteous, you know, um, person who, you know, has to have all the answers or be the one with the last say all the time. And so anyways, these are just some symptoms of a leader who hasn't stared down their wolf. And that's a reference to staring down the wolf of fear. And by fear, I mean all the biases and shadow aspects of ourselves that um, hold us back from our true nature. So that's what the book is about. So I tell some really cool stories in there about how some special operations ops leaders have exemplified what I call the seven commitments of courage, trust, respect, growth, excellence, resilience, and alignment. And then how yours truly has fallen on his face with those same (laughs) commitments, but I'm getting better. Trust me. At any rate, um, if you're interested, staringdownthewolf.com also has some free video training on it, or you can order it at Amazon or whatnot. So thanks for your support. I really appreciate it. So back to Susan, our main attraction. So Susan Scott is the founder and CEO of Fierce Conversations. So she's known, a well-known leadership coach uh, who has a bold and practical approach to development um, around this topic of having fierce conversations, which is not as easy as it sounds. So her book, Fierce Conversations, Achieving Success at Work and in Life, One conversation at a time is something we're going to discuss today. She's a very successful and sought after Fortune 100 speaker and an all around awesome person. (laughs) So, Susan, thanks so much for being here today. I really appreciate it. Our first question Are you still in your treehouse? I am. I am. And I. (laughs) I'm here with my three dogs, two Labradoodles and a Yorkshire Terrier. So if you hear dog noises in the background, that's that help. <laughs> and I just noticed a little while ago that my socks don't match, but who cares? Okay. <laughs> who cares? <laughs> Fortunately, we're not on video. So no. um, unfortunately, I'd love to see the socks <laughs> and the dogs, but that'll have to be for another, another conversation. So yeah, what what interesting times, right? We live in, I mean, this, this just to timestamp that this recording is happening, uh, what, is it April 9th today? Yes, I've it is. i lost track of time. Yeah, and in fact, um, my team and I are really scrambling. We want to get out a free mini course next week for everybody who's at home, you know, working from mm-hmm. home and, and struggling with, with isolation and anxiety mm-hmm. and all those things. I mean, there are not enough Netflix series and Nobody's motivated <laughs> right? enough to read a novel. We're all gaining weight and we're feeling guilty because we know we should be putting this time to better use. So we're gonna we're going to offer we're gonna talk about three different kinds of conversations that would be great to have during this time. Yeah, I tell you what, man. You know, um a crisis has a remarkable way of bringing out the best and the worst in people. Yeah, it does. And then when yeah. I say the worst, I don't mean people are bad people. I mean all the all those aspects, you know, the shadow, the, the emotional baggage, all this stuff that we kept bottled up and, and uh, it's pretty easy when everything's in control, but when it's not, uh, you know, when things spiral out of control, all of a sudden that stuff leaks out all over the place. That is so true. And something I have really noticed that is causing all kinds of havoc is that our tendency as human beings to make up stories about other mm-hmm. people and about what's going on and behave as if our stories are true. Oh, and when we're, yeah, and when we're isolated and there's nobody to say, 
what? <laughs> right. <laughs> Think That's what? Um, you know, we kind of go with those stories and can spiral downward into a very dark place. So right. it's, you know, oh my gosh, I just, I'm confident that we're all going to return to a new and hopefully greatly improved normal, you know, sometime mm-hmm. this summer or fall. I agree with that. But in the meantime, you know, people, some people are really struggling. I'm a card carrying introvert, so I'm quite happy here in the treehouse, although I didn't intend to be here this long. I came right. here early March thinking I'd be here for a week, and I'm still here and will probably be here for another month, maybe two. Who knows? <laughs> but I'm lucky to have this place, so I, I'm not complaining. Right. Well, it's interesting. I was just reflecting on how, you know, maybe you experienced this, but I had all these events lined up, right, that yeah. just suddenly got canceled. Yeah. And how much of a relief that was for me. <laughs> because, you know, about half of them I probably shouldn't have said yes to. Yeah. And the other half, you know, <laughs> are just kind of routine. And it's just nice to have a break from, you know, the just, you know, the rabbit, you know, it the, totally, whatever, the totally, squirrel spinning it, the wheel around, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I was supposed to be a speaker at some events and those events have been canceled. And I had the right. same reaction you did as like, Oh, this is fantastic. You know, <laughs> I mean, I love to share everything about fierce conversations with people because it's, it's really why I'm here, I think. But, course, but, right. but to have a break, it's fabulous. You know, the, the very first sentence in my book is no plan survives its collision with reality. Nice. And we, yeah. this world has had a massive collision with a common enemy. COVID-19, mm-hmm. and it has seriously complicated our favorite plans about how things were going to go. But I see this as a time to really reflect, to reboot, to have a series of conversations with ourselves. Mm-hmm. And, you know, even though technology is is allowing us to see one another, and I'm FaceTiming with my granddaughters and you know, with my friends and everything and Zoom. Gosh, I've never been in so many Zoom meetings in my life. <laughs> Me neither. And, but, awesome. but, but technology does not ensure the quality of those conversations. Not and at all. So, you know, that's, that's really, that's been our focus. Yeah. And also when we're forced to just slow down and to not leave our homes, you know, the first fierce conversation you got to have is with yourself, I think. Yeah. Yep. Right. Around what is the story you were living? What was the hamster wheel that I was on that kept, you know, that caused me to say yes to things that maybe I should never have said yes to or weren't serving me? And um, what patterns, you know, were ruling my life that I can now take a serious look at and maybe change? I couldn't agree more. I mean, one of the conversations I'll be recommending to people who attend our, our free course is to, to write your own personal stump speech. And it, it answers four questions. Where am I going? Why mm-hmm. am I going there? Which is kind of mm-hmm. a big deal. Right. Who's going with me and how am I going to get there? And it should be, it really should be addressed at a high level. Mm-hmm. It's time to, to, to focus on what really matters rather than arbitrary, empty notions of fulfillment and success. And it really, you know, when you get this right, your stump speech should sing to your soul. It should want to change you. And so if ever there was a time to contemplate changes that that you want to make in your life, this is a perfect opportunity. Yeah, I agree. I don't know if you have this experience, but most of the people that I train or that I kind of come into contact with have some sense of discontentedness Mm. or did. Yeah. And uh, like some subtle, like feeling that they could be doing something different or better or more aligned or more powerful or more Mm -hmm. in service. And yet they're kind of stuck. They've got a lot invested in that structure and in the people they're supporting, you know, not just family, but often their team if they're entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, all of a sudden if um, COVID and then the U.S. government or whatever country you're in suddenly says all stop to the economy. Right. What a great opportunity to stare down that wolf of fear and be like, wow, this is it. This is my moment. You know, your book yeah. is perfect for this time because that COVID is a wolf, is for sure a wolf that yeah. all of us need to stare down. Otherwise, yeah. it's going to gobble us up, you know. And and I no, know no. that some people are really kind of losing it. 
and relationships. You know, when people are, <laughs> there've been a lot of cartoons and jokes about what's happening with marriages right now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's hilarious, and, I mean, it's not funny, but the cartoons and the memes have been. They are, they're funny. hilarious. Although I have to say my favorite meme lately is the, the woman who turned herself into a potato and led a, a meeting, a Zoom <laughs> meeting as a potato. She didn't want to, she didn't mean to, but she didn't know how to fix the problem. <laughs> so That's funny. Well, let's talk about a little bit, you know, we'll, we'll come back to COVID-19 because it's like, you yeah. can't dance on the elephant for too long. Yeah. But how did you kind of get involved in, in helping leaders have fierce conversations or to take a look at the stories that they're, you know running in their head and to overcome them and become well, leaders. Well, I had been chairing two groups of non-competing CEOs in Seattle, where I live, when I'm not in my treehouse. <laughs> right. And I had been doing that for 13 years, and I had two functions. One was to meet with each one of them once a month for about a 90-minute to two-hour sort of come-to-God chat about what was going on mm-hmm. in their lives. And my my focus there was to try to zero in on what was the most important thing that was on their plate rather than just going down a checklist and how's this happening Mm -hmm. and what's happening here and how are sales and blah, blah, blah. You know, that sometimes that was not the most important thing. thing. And And, and why were you qualified to do that? I wasn't. Oh, I wasn't. (laughs) (laughs) I wasn't. And I'm probably. Make it you make it. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I was an English major, Mark. I, I love to read great literature and I did not study business. Mm. However, I did, uh, after I taught high school English for several years, I ended up my husband and I, we moved to Seattle from Missouri, and mm-hmm. I ended up going to work for a search firm. And it was it was amazing because I didn't even know. I, mean, I remember meeting Bill Gates, who probably doesn't even remember meeting me, when he had just moved to the area and he had, I think, 15 employees. Wow. And there had no furniture yet. And so I kicked off my high heels and sat on the floor and said, what do you need? And they started telling me, and I said, okay, I don't speak this language, you know. Right. I, I will, if you will tell me where one of those exotic creatures might be found, I'll go after them for you, but you're going to have to humor me a little bit and educate me. And they did. And and over time, I learned a lot about business, a lot, mm-hmm. a lot, a lot about business. But, you know, I, I don't know. I think I think I got hired to chair these groups of CEOs in Seattle because the organization that was overlooking all of this globally didn't have any women in that role. And I think they thought we're probably going to get sued if we don't hire a woman. And (laughs) (laughs) somebody recommended me and I managed to get in under the wire before they slapped on all these qualifications, none of which I, I had, and I would never have made it. But the thing was, I ended up being extremely successful in the role mm-hmm. and both, you know, working with one on one with with my clients and also once a month, each group would spend a whole day together to mm-hmm. advise one another on their most pressing issues. And I really struggled because it's like, how am I going to in, in the one to one, how am I going to spend two hours with this very busy challenge individual that will be worth it? To them. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I sure as heck don't know anything about all these 30 different industries in which I'm now involved. Um, so I'm not going to be saying, I, there, here's what you need to do. So I had to, I had to come up with an approach that allowed me to ask questions such that as you went deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, those are my dogs growling in the background. I'm going <laughs> to, they're I'm giving you props. Like, Good job. Good job. <laughs> um, and and they went deeper and deeper and then they they began to unearth the importance of what they needed to do and 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 focus and next steps without me advising them and mm-hmm. they were very successful and still are those CEOs and when they would sometimes be asked you know what's you know happening in your life th- these days it's a value to you they would they would sometimes speak about their conversations with me and with one another in the meetings mm-hmm. and so and the meetings were i mean they blew my socks off it's like i had a 50 yard line seat 
on some of the most interesting lives in Seattle. Mm. And there, it was no holds barred. You had to tell the truth. And once in a while, mm. in a one-to-one, I would unearth something with a CEO and say, and I would say, we're going to take this to the group. And he or she would say, oh, no, we're not. I'm not going to take mm. that. I'm not going to share that with anyone. And I would say, oh, yeah, yeah, you are, because you need mm. you need help. And these people love you. And they can be of help, and we're going to do that, and we would do that, and then there would wow. be help. And the answers that we got to were so much better than answers that any one of us could have ever arrived at. We needed those competing views of of reality. You know, we needed all of them because when we heard everybody's ideas and suggestions, then what would finally emerge would be a truly elegant solution or next step. And then then the other thing was that the theme that ran through almost everything, every issue, whether they were trying to solve a problem or make a decision or design a strategy or evaluate an opportunity, it always required a conversation or a meeting. I mean, that was almost mm-hmm. always the next step. And sometimes how they got into some of the pickles they got into was because of failed or missing conversations with mm-hmm. individuals or with their whole team or with their clients. And so, you know, it just began to, to be clear to me that this was all about conversations, that we really, right. really are navigating our professional and our personal lives one conversation at a time. And then they would say, come in and I want to have conversations like this inside my company. Will you come in and teach us? And I did. And then my Mm -hmm. peers around the world said, will you show us what you're doing with your CEO? Mm -hmm. I said, of course. And I did. And then people said, write this down, write this down. And I honestly had not planned to, but I finally did. And I can't, I mean, what's, what has happened since then has been amazing because it's really clear that I was not the only person on this planet who is longing to have conversations that were meaningful, <laughs> that right. actually accomplished something. That's so that's awesome. how I got started. It's from all that work with the CEOs and paying attention to my own life and my own marriage, which was quite rocky at the time. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Hey, folks, I want to tell you about a coffee alternative that I really enjoy that has medicinal mushrooms and adaptogens. It's got caffeine, but one-seventh as a cup of coffee, and you get the sustainable energy without the anxiety or jitters or the crash of coffee. It's got turmeric for inflation, cinnamon to suppress sugar craving, cacao and chai for mood and energy, lion's mane for focus, cordyceps for your physical performance, and chaga and reishi for immune and stress response. It's loaded. It gives me energy and focus without those jitters you get from drinking coffee. They donate a portion of each month's revenue to the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, which is important to me because we support vets with post-traumatic stress, and those things help with depression. The team at Mudwater is giving you a special code, Unbeatable Mind, where you can receive 20% off your order at their website. Their website is mudwtr.com. That's M-U-D-W-T-R.com. Get 20% off using the code Unbeatable Mind. Who ya? A couple of things come up. One, one is an observation or a series of observations and, and then a question for you. The observation is that at all, you know, you, you become a very effective coach, but you didn't have to have, you, you know, even oh, self-proclaim this. You didn't have to have the business ex- expertise no. to be a good coach. I didn't. And consider that nowadays all leaders need to be coaches mm-hmm. and how often that they go back and try to rely on their expertise mm-hmm. in that role as a coach. And, and that's not what the coaches or the people they're trying to coach or mentor really need. They need someone to listen to them and, to right? and to someone to ask good questions. Yeah. Right. So that's a real insight for a lot of people. Like, Oh shit, I don't have to be, you know, I don't have to be an expert or have some sort of positional level in order to be a coach, I just need to actually develop good communication skills. You know, and the other thing about that, Mark, is that it is a heavy load. If you think that your job is to advise people, that is a heavy load. And you're yeah. kind of sunk, too, because right. you're not you're not always going to be right, for example. I mean, it's just, it's too much of a burden. And so 
we're, we're training within companies all over the world from startups to fortune 100s. And one of the things that we teach is our approach to that one-to-one conversation, whether it's just mm-hmm. coaching or a monthly check-in or whatever it is. And people are thrilled with the approach because it is, it is just seven questions that you ask and one follows very naturally after the other. And you end up arriving at someplace rather extraordinary that you would mm. never have arrived at if you had jumped right in with, oh, okay, well, gee, I've seen that before. And here's what I recommend, you know, right. that's just, right. yeah. Well, this, the, the follow-up to my other uh, observation was a question that was kind of cu- curious to me because I've been involved in, in those types of groups like Vistage and, and YPO and whatnot. And the forum experience or that group experience is, you know, can be not always, but it can be quite extraordinary for a few reasons. One is the power of the coach, which you're, you know, you've exemplified. Another is the confidentiality. And then Mm -hmm. just, you know, the, the depth that it can go where Mm -hmm. these individuals typically don't have those conversations at home or at the office. So have you seen where an executive team working with you has developed that same level of trust and transparency as you experienced in the, um, in the coaching group? I have. And, and let me just say that that's powerful, even for CEOs, it's lonely at the top. Mm -hmm. And for years I bought into that, but actually I don't think that's true. I mean, if, if it, if it is lonely at the top, it's your damn fault. You know, I mean, it it (laughs) does not need to be lonely at the top. You've got all these people who bring through the doors with them, once we can get back into our offices, who bring through the doors with all this wonderful intelligence, all this desire to do good. And and yet we don't ask them. And yet the answers are in the room. We have those answers. And so we do, I mean, one of the things we teach is how to turn a, your ordinary waste of time meetings into sort of think tanks. And it's Mm -hmm. very important. I mean, what gets talked about within a company, how it gets talked about, and who is invited to the the conversations determines what's going to happen and what's Mm -hmm. not going to happen. So, you know, I just, when I think about companies and teams, I think about meetings and meetings and meetings and meetings and meetings and more meetings. (laughs) Death by meetings. Oh my gosh. All attended by the usual suspects. And you already know, you know, what Jim's going to say and what Mary is going to refuse to say. And you're always going to know what the person leading it, how they're going to react to everything that happens. And it is, oh, it's so disheartening. And I mean, some Times you walk out of a meeting thinking, why did I even bother to get out of bed this morning? So, <laughs> you know, Been there. <laughs> That's hilarious. I mean, I don't, I'm not, some, some meetings can go on for quite a while while everybody is still wondering what this meeting is even about. You know, what, mm-hmm. why are we here? I mean, what is it that you want from us? I remember reading mm-hmm. a book by Studs Terkel so long ago. The book was called Working. And he told a story about a young woman named Nora who had just graduated from a very prestigious university and got her first job at a really cool company. And she could hardly wait to make a difference. And very quickly, she realized that everything that she had to bring was not welcome. And that um, she just found herself making herself smaller and smaller and smaller until she, and this is how she put it, until I absented my spirit from my work. Wow. And that wow. Point, that's that interesting because that, that describes the average workplace. Yeah, that yes. is heartbreaking. Talk about people have- engagement, you know, employee <laughs> engagement. And, and a lot of people have absented their spirit from their work because we're not really inviting them to work with us to figure things out. There is a, mm-hmm. a true story about um, Jack Welch when, when he bought some manufacturing company and he gathered everybody together in the big uh, their big warehouse and he made his little speech and then he said, mm-hmm. you know, and we've got problems to solve here and I'd really be open to your ideas. And a guy in the back of the auditorium wearing overalls waved his, his arm and so Jack Welch said, 
yeah, did you have something to say? And the guy said, yes, I have a suggestion. And he made this suggestion. And Jack Welch said, that, that, is, a, that is a really good idea. And the guy said, Mr. Welch, for years, they've been paying for our hands when they could have had our heads for free. <laughs> Isn't that good? I love it. I love it. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, this takes courage, right? And that was like the first commitment that I talked about in my book, Stirring Down the World, because, you know, courage is not, it doesn't come easy. It's hard. It's a, it's a practice for us in the SEALs. We had to practice courageous things to be Mm -hmm. courageous. Everyone mm -hmm. thinks that you're just kind of born that way. I don't agree with that at all. Mm -mm. I imagine that's something that kind of shows up for you in teaching people how to have fierce conversations. The first step is like, it's courage. You know, how do you develop that? What's your, yeah. And that? The, the, what helps is that nobody taught us, certainly nobody taught me how to have the conversations that were important to me. I had no idea that I was navigating my life one conversation at a time. Mm -hmm. Not a clue. It just hadn't put it together. And some conversations I had tried and they had failed utterly. I mean, they went south in a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. And so I just stopped having them. And I just withheld what I was really thinking and feeling in many situations. More, more actually at home than at work for whatever reason. So. Mm -hmm. It, it, I think a lot of people have sort of given up for very good reasons. I mean, they've been in the room when you know, somebody sort of got shot, you know. Mm -hmm. um, gee, you remember when, when Jack pushed back on the boss's favorite ideas? You know, I, re I really miss Jack. He was a great guy. You know? mm -hmm. um, so it's the skill. If we have the skill, if we know how to have conversations that – interrogate reality and provoke learning and tackle tough challenges and enrich relationships, then it's not so scary. And then after right. you've done it once and you say, gosh, nobody died here. In fact, I mean, I get emails from people all the time saying, I just had the best conversation with so-and-so that I've mm -hmm. ever had. Or I had a really, I went into a conversation extremely worried about how it was going to go. And it yeah. was it was wonderful. Were there any training wheels, you know, like <laughs> we had a principle crawl, walk, run, right? First right. start with the basics. And then, you know, once you master the basics, you pick up the speed a little bit. What are the training wheels for, for having fierce conversations? The training wheels. I, I mean, you can, you can teach somebody how to do something all day long, but unless there is a very clear and compelling why, mm -hmm. uh, they, they may or may not embrace it. And so, you know, I'm, I'm not neutral at all. I believe, and, and I, I may have shared with you, I don't know, years ago when I was working with all those CEOs, I was reading Hemingway's The Sun Also Rises, in which a character is asked, how did you go bankrupt? Mm -hmm. And he responds gradually and then suddenly. Right. Yeah, and I, and I, I had sort of what my niece calls apostrophes. <laughs> she meant, she meant epiphanies, but I've always liked the <laughs> idea of having an apostrophe. <laughs> and so I had this apostrophe that our careers and our companies and our relationships and our whole lives succeed or fail gradually, then suddenly one conversation at a time, one successful mm -hmm. one, one failed one, one missing conversation. And mm -hmm. So that idea is is very helpful to people. That's that's one of the training wheels. Mm. And there's another one, which I actually learned from David White, who is a poet from uh, mm -hmm. yeah. England. Just love Beautiful. David. And then yeah. it's W-H-Y-T-E, White. Mm -hmm. He's from Yorkshire, England. And he, he was talking one time and he said, you know, the young man who's newly married is often really puzzled and frustrated and perplexed because this lovely person to whom he has plighted his troth, that's how they talk in England, <laughs> <laughs> and with whom he hopes to spend the rest of a glorious life, she insists on appearing before his face on a regular basis, wanting to talk yet again about the quality of their relationship. <laughs> You know, and he wonders, why are we having this conversation again? Could we have one 
massive conversation about this and then coast for a year. Right. Two, Didn't we yeah. talk about that five years ago? Yeah, Come on. This know, is, everything's fine. And then I tell you that I loved you like, you know, <laughs> on our last anniversary or something. And, and then he said, long about age 42. And he was 42 at the time he said this because he was speaking from personal experience. He said, long about age 42, if he's been paying attention, it dawns on him. This ongoing, robust conversation I've been having with my wife is not about the relationship. The conversation Mm -hmm. is the relationship. Mm -hmm. And man, I'll tell you, Mark, when I heard that, my heart just stopped because Mm -hmm. I had just separated from my husband after many years of marriage. And that explained everything. Mm -hmm. And it, so if, you know, when people, and it's one of the things that we, we teach the conversation is the relationship. And if you can see that there's something to that, then if you and I add another topic to the list of things we can't talk about, because it wrecks another weekend at home or another Mm -hmm. meeting at work, then all of the possibilities for that relationship become smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. And even all of the possibilities for the individuals in the mm-hmm. relationship become smaller until one day I notice I am making myself quite small in every conversation. I am engaging in three minute conversations that are so empty of meaning they crackle. Yeah. It's all surface chop. It it's funny. It reminds me of my wife who's a therapist and, you know, I would come home from work in the early days. She's like, how was your day? And I'd be like, fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And then she goes, you know what fine means, right? I was like, yes. <laughs> I think. She yeah. goes, it means effed up, insecure, yeah. neurotic, and emotionally incompetent. Yep. And I'm like, oh, that's me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Stop. Okay. Maybe it wasn't so fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's really, really good. It's really oh, good. Man. And, then, cool. and so, then the third, and then there are actually three training wheels. The yeah. third one is that we have to realize that all conversations are with myself and sometimes they involve other people. Mm. And what I mean by that is I'm running everything in my life through my own personal context, my own filter, my own belief Mm -hmm. system that causes me to, my beliefs cause me to behave in a certain way and my behavior produces the results in my life. And so these conversations that I am unconsciously constantly having with myself, like at the beginning of this, when I said we make up stories about other people and then behave Mm -hmm. as if our stories are true, Mm -hmm. our beliefs are running the show. Our context is running the show. So to become aware of what, what story have I told myself here about this or that person? And is it serving me or them or any of us? And and check um, me out. Reminds me that we, yeah, check. We we started this whole conversation saying the first fierce conversation to have every day is with yourself. Yep, exactly. You know, we have like the wolf of fear and the wolf of courage. That's one way to look at. It. So there's, there's two there's two parts of you that need to have a conversation. Mm. And also this, you know, the the story that we tell ourselves defines you know how we're going to contextualize and tell stories about other people. It does, and we're telling ourselves all kinds of stories right now while we're at right. home with very little to distract us. Right. And if we, if we don't check out somehow, some way check to see if our stories are true or maybe we, maybe they aren't and often right. they aren't. And, um, but we, there's something about human beings that we kind of like to embrace the scary story, the bad story, the mad, <laughs> angry story. We kind of get, there's some juice there, you know, we get off um, on it. Right. Well, yeah, it's there's... also, it's kind of a condition program behave cultural behavior just yeah. because yeah. the way our media yeah. is and our, our society has been really negative. Oh been my really God. Negative, you know, for Tell a long me time. About so. it. Like I would yeah. rather be yeah. angry and point my finger and be critical of the world and all those people out there than be happy and peaceful and productive. Right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Be part of the solution. Yeah. So one of the things that we aim for is transparency. And we also find, and this is in my organization, that it's very difficult. And you talk about radical transparency. Yeah. Can we kind of look into that a little bit? Sure. In fact, I did a, a TEDx talk yes. on radical transparency that anybody can watch if they want to. And it has, I think it has 
I mean, I gave it a while ago, but I know it has a lot of humor. Um, and then it has some pretty important points, but mm-hmm. radical transparency. Look, the truth, the truth is always going to out in the end. You right. might as well share it. And for example, right now, one of the things that my company is doing is we, we just got the results of our best companies to work for survey. And so we, and, and this is really important to us because this helps us know how we're doing in the eyes of our employees. And we always share everything with them, the good, the bad, the not, you know, everything, and then involve them in suggestions for, you know, what do we keep? What do we need to change? How do we change those things? Mm-hmm. And, and I even remember, you know, in the, in the huge downturn in 2008, Starbucks was really hit hard and Howard Schultz stepped back into the company and he said to all of his shareholders and all of his employees and anybody who was interested, he said, we're, we are, we tried to grow too fast in too many locations and we've overreached and now we need to pull back and we are regrouping and our stock price is going to drop for a while And Mm -hmm. then it will come back up because of the plans we're putting in place. And one of the things that we're doing is we are changing out our machines. We, you know, the whole reason I started this was because this was a place for people to come and have conversations and Mm -hmm. and talk and over a cup of coffee. And we've got these huge machines where the barista cannot even see the customer. (laughs) And we're replacing them with the low profile machines. So there's eye contact. We can look at each other. We can talk while a drink is being prepared. And so he said, here's what we did wrong. Bullet, 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 bullet. You know, here are the things we're changing. Bullet, 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 bullet. And I absolutely invite any of you to offer suggestions. And here's where to send them. I mean, that that was a That's great cool. example of radical transparency. Mm-hmm. And um, so getting to the truth as opposed to, you know, some sort of group think or. Well, and putting it out there, because if you think people don't know what's really going on, you're wrong. They right. do. They, <laughs> they absolutely know. They may not know all the details, but if something isn't working, if there's trouble in the waters, whether it's in a company or within a team or within a family, a marriage, whatever it is, we know we just kind of don't really want to talk about it right now. We will say, I'm fine. What's wrong, honey? Nothing. Nothing's wrong. And same thing in the company. You know, are we okay? Yeah, we're going to be fine. Don't worry about it. You know, Mm -hmm. which Mm -hmm. is just not comforting at all. So it's really important to, as Shakespeare would say, screw our courage to the sticking point. And, (laughs) say, here's what's really happening. Some of this is great. Some of this is really not great. Right. And here's what we're planning to do. And what do you think? Right. Hey, folks, I want to bring your attention to a product developed by a Navy SEAL friend of mine who was a doctor. Uh, First, he was a SEAL, then he became a doctor, and then he went back and worked with the SEALs. His name is Doc Parsley. Some of you might have heard of him by now. We call him the Sleep Doc. All these SEALs were starting to come to him and, and, you know, with these symptoms that looked like adrenal fatigue. And so he started treating adrenal fatigue and realized that the common denominator with all these guys that they weren't sleeping. It's a pretty big problem in military spec ops with the pace of operations and combat. And these guys were just all out of whack. Cortisol was racing their body. Their hormones were depleted. And, you know, they had the, essentially the, the testosterone level of 13-year-old girls is the way he jokes about it. They had a big problem. And what he found is that they were working out like madmen, but they're putting on weight. Their, you know, cognitive level was like they were drunk. Anyways, they were, they had this perception that they could perform, but they just couldn't perform anymore. And it was a real problem. So he identified that the common denominator was lack of sleep. So even an hour of not enough sleep a night over the course of a, of a year is going to lead to 14 pounds of weight gain and could degrade your performance by up to 30%. Throws your testosterone, your growth hormones, in, in, insulin sensitivity all out of whack. And it's going to create emotional uh, instability, decision-making um, challenges, impulse uh, control challenges, and decrease your willpower. Basically, your prefrontal cortex is compromised. 
So what he did is he, he went around and he, and, he, and he said, go buy this, buy this, buy this, and then, you know, start taking it and it worked. And so they said, well, this is a pain in the neck to buy all this. Can you, can you put it all together into one thing? And so that became Doc Parsley's sleep remedy. I tried this recently at our Unveil Mind Summit and it worked really, really well. I, I kid you not. Like I took it and I fell asleep within 20 minutes and uh, I didn't have any grogginess when I woke up. I thought it was great stuff. So um, I told him I wanted to uh, let my folks know about it, let you know people who are listening to this podcast know about it. And he offered everyone a 10% off. So if you want to try Doc Parsley's Sleep Re- Remedy, uh, which is essentially a, it's just a supplement. It's a nutritional supplement. It's all natural stuff, which creates a normal cascade of the physiological things that are supposed to happen when um, you're going to go to sleep. But a lot of us don't have that cascade or don't have that stuff happening anymore because of our lifestyle. So this will kind of stimulate um, proper, you know, preparation for sleep and, and, the, and the sleep cycles. Um, he has an unlimited, no questions asked, money back guarantee. Um, you can't beat that. So go to docparsley.com, D-O-C-P-A-R-S-L-E-Y.com and use the code unbeatable mind, all one word, all, all one word, unbeatable mind when you check out to get 10% off. And uh, highly recommend it. Hoo ya. You mentioned earlier that you, like most of us, are doing more and more meetings virtually using, you know, things like Zoom and yep. whatnot. What are some of the landmines with regard to working remotely that can become obstacles to really effective communications? Meetings by themselves, and I, I talked a little bit about this before, are mm-hmm. often a waste of time. Mm-hmm. Um, just not very productive and, and people, but people are there in the, in a room together in a normal situation and they can see each other. So, you know, nobody's, nobody's playing solitaire or on the, right. on, on the board. <laughs> you got to put their best foot forward, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, um, whatever dysfunctions exist within any organization, those dysfunctions will be amplified in a remote world. Interesting. So for example, what I would say when there's going to be a meeting, the way we do it is we, we send out well, first, first we, we consider very carefully who should be at this meeting, whose perspective would it be really useful for us to understand? And that's not just the executives. That's the person who's going to be affected by something. Who's going to be carrying it out a person who sees things very differently than we do um, and is often the naysayer, that person is very useful too. And Mm -hmm. so we're, we're thoughtful about who to invite. And then uh, we, we send out the information. This, this is the issue we're going to put on the table and this is why it is important. Mm -hmm. And I want you all to come prepared to share your perspective. And I mean that because I'm going to call on each one of you. Mm -hmm. I really want. So that way, for one thing, you start the meeting with a bang because everybody knows this is the issue and this is why it's important. And then you also, so you, every, so everybody's in the, the meeting, the zoom meeting or whatever kind of remote meeting. And you say, all right, let me just review this, review this and give you a little more information. The -hmm. issue is blah, 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 blah. It is important because blah, 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 blah. Here are Mm -hmm. the results it is currently producing, blah, 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 blah. Here are the outcomes we want instead, blah, 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 blah. Here's what we have done so far. Here's what options we are considering. And and if I had to make a decision today without your input, this is the one I would make. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Like so that. you're, so a lot of people don't do that. Yeah. You put your stake in, yeah. You yeah. plant your stake before yeah. listening to everyone else and revising your. <laughs> yeah. Your but then you say, and you have to mean this, you cannot fake fears. Then you say, so your value in this and our time together is to tell me what I'm missing from your perspective, what you would do instead of what I just said, or if you would do what I just said, why? And if we get this right, I will be different when this meeting is over. Mm-hmm. That is a very humble, vulnerable place to come from. 
And I'll tell you, people will lean in. And then you also, you do call on everybody and you have to keep track. You have to notice who has spoken up Mm -hmm. and who hasn't. And if somebody hasn't spoken up, you have to call on them. Hey, Jane, haven't heard from you. Well, I don't really have anything to add. Well, what would you add, Jane, if you did have something to add? (laughs) Interesting. (laughs) You just describe a meeting to kind of uh, solve a problem. And that's definitely a meeting that we want to have and want, you know, engagement toward. What are some meetings that we shouldn't have, in your opinion? You know, maybe ones that you're just like, I got to stop doing this. This is a waste of time. Well, I was just working with the um, a, a very high level executive in a university. Let's just put it that way. Mm-hmm. And I worked with her for about three months. And this woman's life was nothing but meetings. I know. Those environments are and I would, back to I back. Would, back, to back. Seriously, consider doing myself in. Uh, I just I can't live like that. <laughs> and I said to her, "Look, you you don't need to go to all those meetings. You could send someone else on your behalf, or you could simply decline altogether because you don't need to be there." And she said, "Oh, I need to be there. It's for prestige. It's for you know visibility. Mm-hmm. It's for what people would think. They expect me to be there." And I said, "Oh, so all of that crap is running your life, whereas you." The reason you came to me was because you have some huge deliverables you're expected to provide for the university, and you don't have time to do any of it because you're in meetings all the time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you didn't call all of those meetings. Some other people called those meetings, but they want you there. And you have to learn to say sometimes to people, I thank you for the invitation. I am absolutely focused on the, the thing that's got my name all over it right now. And I need to decline. I'm not, I'm not, but I'd be happy to send someone else for my department and, and just let it go. And that was almost impossible for her to do. Mm -hmm. Um, It was really, really a struggle. And she kept giving me all the reasons why she couldn't possibly miss those meetings. Mm -hmm. And I finally said, I think we're wasting each other's time. You know, I mean, you're, you've got, you have got your excuses down cold, girl. (laughs) Right. <laughs> you know? Practicing them every day. Yeah, <laughs> man, good. You're enforcing them all the time. Do you hear yourself? What you're saying? I want this, but here are all the reasons why I can't have that. Mm-hmm. And so, I think we should not have so many meetings. We should not always invite the same people to the meetings that we do have. Let I mean, some people will be thrilled to death if they're told you don't have to attend. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, right? Don't That's attend. fascinating. So I, I just think meetings that aren't absolutely necessary, don't have them. And, and also another thing that happens is people, there are some people who are late to meetings and the person running it waits, says, let's wait until everybody's here. No, no, mm-hmm. <laughs> let's start no. when we said we were going to start. In mm-hmm. fact, let's close the door. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so stop that behavior, right? Yeah. Now, Rex. <laughs> yeah. And I had reminds- that with a with a pharmaceutical company it was they were the worst, and also a, a big uh, movie company where everybody waited for the, the 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 CEO to appear, and he was always late, and so they didn't bother to come. It was just ridiculous. So, you know, starting on time, you have to you have to honor people's time. I mean, that's right. a precious commodity. Don't waste people. It's like Bob Dylan, that line from one of his songs. I'm not saying you treated me unkind. You just kind of wasted my precious time. <laughs> I, love, <laughs> I that. love that. So we just don't have the right to waste anybody's precious time. Right. A death by meaning is so prevalent. You know, oh, I, yeah. I, I did a, a training session with um, Walmart um, executive team, their international executive team. And yes. they confided to me that, you know, they, they have over the team, not just the CEO, but the team has over 780 hours or something like meetings scheduled, you know, throughout the year already. And then there's all the other stuff that goes on. Oh, wow. And I was looking, I just like, holy cow. Yeah. And that was my, in what you just said, some version of that was kind of my recommendation. It's like, this is a real issue, guys. And I wasn't in a long-term coaching relationship. I was just doing a three-hour training on how mm-hmm. how they can get control of their mental, emotional states. And I was like, this is one of the problems you guys have. Yeah, you absolutely. You have no time to get control of your mental, emotional state. You're just running from one thing to another, to another, to another. Well, everything, all this stuff about meetings is is in my book too. So if somebody 
you know, wants to know how to run a fantastic meeting, they can find it there on all the details about how to do it. It's really very simple. It's just yeah. we we don't do it that way. <laughs> well, it takes practice, right? Yeah. These are things you got to practice. Having first conversations not easy, but you can. But do honestly, it. Mark, what we what we teach is not complicated at all. When somebody walks out of our one of our trainings, whether it's a classroom or a remote virtual training. They're armed and dangerous. They're ready because it's they and they don't have to refer back to, you know, the the materials that we gave them. I mean, they got it because we when we're training people, we do real play. We don't do role play. So people put a real issue that's very mm-hmm. important to them in their lives right now on the table and they practice whether it's a one to one or a feedback or confrontation or a meeting or whatever it is. And they practice using the model with their real issue. So that when they leave, they're, they're, like I say, armed and dangerous. They're ready to go. It's right. not complicated at all. You don't have to be a psychologist. You don't have to know what everybody's different personality styles are like. You don't have to know any of that. It works with everybody. In fact, it works with cultures all over the world, including uh, cultures who you know are very, very keen on relationships and never causing anyone to lose face or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So there's, you know, fierce conversations. I mean, one of the objectives is to enrich relationships Mm -hmm. and that's really important. So it isn't complicated. And once you have the skill, then the courage comes along with it. And once you've tried it once or twice, it becomes a way of life. It's not just Mm -hmm. something you pull out on special occasions. It's, it's really a way of life. Yeah. Love that. We got to wrap up soon, but I, I do want to ask you, you know, with this COVID crisis and like you running your own business and working with other companies, you know, what are some of the, how are things going to be different when we get back to, or get to whatever you see as our new normal, like what's going to be different and how can we prepare for that? From well, um, things are going to be different. I mean, there are, there are trends that were happening before COVID that are going to accelerate as a result of COVID. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lots more people uh, not putting in the typical nine to five day Mm -hmm. or not putting it in always in the, in an office setting. A lot of work needs to be done virtually with virtual reality, with all kinds of very, very cool tools that are being developed. I'm trying to think of all of it. I just had this long conversation yesterday with six people about this very topic. And if only I could remember what we, mm-hmm. what all we said. <laughs> I don't remember. It was what, a long time ago. It was really. such a long time ago. But we were talking about the, you know, the, the company of the future, especially training companies. And I think right. I remember many years ago, Faith Popcorn, who's America's leading trend expert, predicted the triumph of the individual. And she was right on. I mean, it's the individual. I mean, Amazon is a perfect example of Mm -hmm. a company that has pays attention to the individual and knows what you want and what you Mm -hmm. like and reminds you, wouldn't you like to order this again? And you were looking at this. How about Mm -hmm. this? So we, you know, one of the things we're going to be doing and we're already we've already well begun is a totally asynchronous version of what we do that allows anybody anytime anywhere to gain some skill but the specific skill that they're interested in at that moment so that you don't have to sit through you know, two days of other stuff to get to the one thing that they really want the most. Mm -hmm. And so. Micro learning. Yes. Micro learning, but totally engaging with all kinds Mm -hmm. of, I did, I don't know if you watched 60 minutes the other night, but it was was fantastic because there's, there are people who interviewed Holocaust survivors and they, you know, like one of the, the gentlemen who's now dead, but he, he was, He was interviewed for five days from nine to five every day wearing the same clothes. And what they did was they asked him a gazillion questions, every question imaginable. And then now people can sit in front of the screen and ask him questions and he answers their questions. And you would swear they were having a conversation with each other. 
<laughs> That's when the person would say, you know, well, what was it like when you first went into the concentration camp? And he would say, oh, I remember that so clearly. Here's what it was like. I mean, it, it's it, it's powerful. And I was thinking, oh, I want to do that with our right. material. I want people to be able to ask a question and get the answer to that question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So That's I think, you know, I think there's probably not going to be as much hugging <laughs> as there has right. been. And, I hope uh, that doesn't go away. That was one of my more favorite things. I know. I, I'm a, quite a hugger and I, I probably will miss that. But I think a lot of us are a little skittish mm-hmm. um, and will be for a while. And I think there will be more virtual working. And And it's really interesting to me what industries have thrived during this time. Yes. So alcohol, um, <laughs> garden centers, <laughs> right. you know, there have been a lot of, of businesses that have done really well. And then the ones that, that haven't and what adaptations they're going to need to make. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I feel very blessed myself because our business, we haven't had to lay anyone off or do any like drastic. We're waiting for the shoe to drop, but, you know, but we offer mental toughness, resiliency, courage training. So guess what? Yeah. Voila. Yes. And I, at the, I right, told, it's the right time, I guess. I told all of our employees that, you know, we're, we definitely have been hit because some of our biggest clients are in retail and right. medicine and aeronautics and industries that have been hugely hit. So our business has just dropped precipitously. Mm. And, but I, I told them, I don't want any of you worrying about paying the rent or your mortgage or buying right. so, you know, it's not the plan to lay anyone off. We are applying for the forgivable loan. Mm-hmm. Yes. And yeah. uh, that's not going to, you know, we're, we're, that's going to, that's going to give us some time, buy us a little time. It, right. right. If you lay everyone off, then you can't work together to pivot, you know? Exactly. And I see how a restaurant has to do that, you know, or, yeah. or those heavy labor, yeah. but man, for the knowledge, knowledge yeah. worker, now's the time to, to really double down and figure it out together, right? Because if you lay everyone off and you're the entrepreneur and you're sitting there alone trying to figure it out, good luck. And everybody you know? is pivoting. I love that word, pivot. And yeah. and if, you know, you need to be able to to be nimble and agile and quick and right. and that's what we're doing. We're we're doing some major pivoting in areas we were headed anyway. This is just yeah. speeding yeah. it up. So yeah. yeah, I I think it's a lot of good stuff is going to come out of this. Although it's I totally feel for the people are, who are having to right. file for unemployment right now. Right. Me too. Yeah. All change comes with pain. You yep. know, but if you, if we breathe into that and we're optimistic and, you know, future focus, then on the other side of that is going to be some, you know, some really nice changes, I think, you know, I and, think and also some, some unpleasant ones, but <laughs> we've always had that. That's the, the yin and yang. That would be called life, life, right? <laughs> That's life. Exactly. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Uh, on that note. So you're, um, where can people find you? I know you have a website and. We do. Work. It's fierce Inc. I N C fierce Inc.com. Okay. So we're there. And then uh, I have two books, Fierce Conversations and then Fierce Leadership. And the subtitle of that book is A Bold Alternative to the Worst Best Practices of Business Today, which (laughs) I've often said to people, it it could have been titled A a Complete Guide to the Fricking Obvious. (laughs) (laughs) So those are two books that people can get anywhere. Is there... it, would it be helpful to read Fierce Conversations before Fierce Leadership or do they kind of I would, I would, I would, on their own? I would read Fierce Conversations first and then Fierce yeah. Leadership is a deeper dive into s- some specific practices like anonymous mm-hmm. feedback that drive mm-hmm. me batty. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I would say go for Fierce Conversations first and then see what you right. think. And if you really like that, then get the other one too. It's a great book and I'm working through it on audiobook, which is – a new thing for me, which is kind of a fun way to, to learn. I'm always listening to a book on audio, on audible and then uh, reading a book on my iPad. And then I have a book book in my hand because I like <laughs> I bookstores, you know? Right. And I Isn't have, cool? we have many I'm ways to consume that content. So. I'm just getting into your book and so excited to read it. Oh, wow. Exciting. Well, yeah. I hope you like it. I'm sure well. Awesome. Well, Susan, we'll, um, We'll uh, spare the listeners um, a little bit more time, let them get back to what they're doing. So thank you so much for your 
time today, man. This has been really just an honor and a ton of fun. And I really appreciate you for what you do and for your time. Thank you, Mark. Thank you for having me. And I really enjoyed it. Yeah. If you ever uh, find yourself down in San Diego, when we're allowed to travel again, it'd be <laughs> great to see you. <laughs> and if I make my way up to Seattle. Yes, yes. It would be, it would be fabulous. Be. Yeah. Well, thanks so much. You're welcome. All right, folks, that was Susan Scott. Check out her um, work at fierceinc.com and uh, Fierce Conversations and Fierce Leadership. This is really, really important. I can't emphasize it enough. I think the next frontier, which is on us right now, so it's not even a frontier anymore, it's like in our face, is to become um, really effective communicators. And I've often said that the level of your emotional awareness and uh, competence is expressed in how we communicate. So you can, hey Mark, you can, can reverse I, engineer it. What's can that? I add one more thought? Yeah, please do, Susan. I, I, I'm in, in uh, fierce leadership. I, I'm telling people, and I'm saying it whenever I speak, if you, if you want to become a great leader or a great human being, you must gain the capacity to connect with the people who are important to you at a deep level. Or lower your aim. <laughs> like so that, or that, lower your aim. Because it's just not going to work, right? No, you do. it's about People human demand it. That's what it's that's about. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. Thanks for sharing. You're welcome. All right, folks. That's the Unbeatable Mind podcast. Thanks so much for listening. Really appreciate you. And uh, stay focused. Uh, stay confident and courageous. And um, just show up every day knowing that uh, you're awesome and the world will be a better place when we get through what we're going through right now. And I appreciate your support. See you next time. Divine out. Lock it low, boys. Time to explode, boys. Make sure you get home, boys.